this is going to look weird because I'm talking into a microphone, but I'm not projecting. The microphone is actually for our live streamers. We have a bunch of people on live stream, um, so just keep that in mind. Um, I want to welcome everybody tonight. First of all, my name is Katya Wald. I'm the executive director here at the MIT Enterprise Forum of Cambridge. I want to thank you all for coming tonight. This is um, one of our programs that we call Get Smarts. Um, this is sort of a tactical workshop, things that entrepreneurs need to know. Um, this is one of about 40 programs we do from September to June. Um, so I encourage all of you to go to our uh, website to actually learn a little bit more about what we do. Because um, I'm not going to do the whole spiel for you guys tonight because there's a lot of content that Mike has. Um, Mike does actually teach um, one of the sessions in our Start Smart class, which starts October 1st. For those entrepreneurs in the group, that's actually a class that we meet here or next door if we can get in there. Um, and that is a class that essentially teaches nuts and bolts of you know your startup um, and starting your company. So if you're interested, I highly recommend that. Um, otherwise, um, I'm going to actually just turn it over to Mike. Just a few um, short things on the live stream. I think Maham put a couple of um, microphones. If you can speak up when you're asking questions, um, that's just going to help it carry to. Um, to the live streamers. Mike's also going to repeat the question, just so you know, and then we'll also chat it into those folks. Um, you will also get a recording of this, so after the event, we'll edit it down and we'll all send you a recording as well. Um, hey, Mike, you ready? All right. Um, I'm going to give him two more minutes. I'm going to stop talking. Um, and if you have any questions for me um, at the end, I'll be here all night. All right, let me move this out of the way. OK, so this page here has a little chart on a little table. Set that in front of you so you can refer to this. OK. This is just, take the second page, also tear it off. So there's some place for notes on the back side. And then there's some exercises. So the last three pages, I think you can probably keep them intact. But it's really up to you. Okay, so let me get into a little bit um, of what crowdfunding is. So crowdfunding in its purest term, and it's kind of like a buzzword now, but crowdfunding itself has been around for a very long time uh, as a philosophical concept, as a community building activity, people chipping in to get something done, okay? So this is really something that goes back ages. Right from the beginning of history, and then you know, if you can even look at that table, I have some sample dates of one of known crowdfunding campaigns. Um, the Statue of Liberty, for example, was a crowdfunding campaign. When the French gave us the Statue of Liberty, they didn't give us a base for it, and it cost a lot of money to build that pedestal that the statue was on. So there was a crowdfunding campaign run via newspapers in New York at the time, where they gathered a lot of money from people to build the base for the Statue of Liberty. Just like that. That's a very organized campaign. Uh, campaigns like this have been run with bands, with artists, with poets, with writers throughout history. People reaching out to their community of fans and saying, fund me. Now, this has been primarily done on the product level. Fund my book, fund my concert, fund my statue, fund my something. So when it got organized, uh, as part of the, I guess, the high tech boom of the early 2000s, uh, platforms started popping up. The platforms around now, the most popular ones, are Indiegogo and Kickstarter. So Kickstarter is a way to digitize that community, to go out and say, fund my thing. I have an idea, and I would like to raise money for it. That's Kickstarter. That's Indiegogo. That's something known as product crowdfunding. Some people also refer to it as reward crowdfunding. Equity crowdfunding is a very different type of animal. Uh, this is something that came into effect in the Jobs Act in 2012. So if you guys remember, and I think everybody here is old enough to have been around in 2008, uh, 2008, the world changed. 
And it changed pretty dramatically. So w in 2008, I was an investment banker. I was working on a trading floor at UBS, which is a big Swiss bank, uh, helping to trade credit derivatives. The very things that crashed the economy, if you remember, right? So I can't take credit for it. It was a team effort, OK? <laughs> but what happened, and it was a radical change because it came at a very interesting time. So at the time, you had a lot of automation popping up, right? Automation in human resources, automation in factories, automation in software, in robotics. All of these things were young. They were nascent, but they were coming up. As soon as people started losing their jobs, as soon as money started running out of companies, there was a huge adoption curve for all of these automation technologies. So 2008, that was really the change when people stopped being employed and robots started taking over. And you can see that trend going on now, right? So a lot of these companies, a lot of these startups, startups like my startup, startup like a lot of people here, and we'll, we'll talk a little bit about what, what a startup is, started coming up. And a lot of those things started being in the automation space, in the replacing people space. And that is a very interesting shift. Now, in 2012, partly in response to this growing uh, automation, partly in response to this tech revolution that drew a lot of people who could not have jobs where they used to have jobs into startups. So I lost my job two times in a year. I, lucky enough, I joined a hedge fund right after I got laid off, and I got laid off again. And this was a common story. I could not get a job. My first startup, I started because I could not get a job, right? I was unemployed and unemployable. My skill set was useless, right? And I had spent a long time developing it. But I'm, I'm a reasonably capable guy, so I decided, hey, why not? I'll start my company, my first one. Oh, it was really bad, but it was there. Now, a lot of people were in my position. So what do you have? You have this amazing group of people leaving jobs that will provide stability and money and starting off and starting companies. A lot of these companies in automation, a lot of them in really innovative ideas. So you have a very high class, high, high quality group of people leaving high quality jobs, starting startups. And as far as I know, that is one of the only times in history that that has happened. Usually startups, right now, startups are primarily, at least that's, that's the idea, startups are primarily for people who cannot get real jobs. Right? And that's a stereotype. So if you guys here have a startup, there's somebody out there thinking, oh, you must not be able to get a real job. Right? So you have to get yourself employed. And we'll talk about how this relates to fundraising and stuff like that, too. In 2008, it was very different. So I digress. In 2012, under the Obama administration, there was something that happened. It was called the Jobs Act. The Jobs Act introduced a lot of reforms. Uh, I'm not going to go into the details of all of the reforms, but one of them is something known as crowdfunding, equity crowdfunding. There were several different titles, as in types of crowdfunding. The one I'm going to talk about today is called Reg CF equity crowdfunding. Regulation CF equity crowdfunding is a way to publicly solicit, as in tell everybody, that you are raising money for your company. Now, if you know anything about securities or finance in general, this is something that's a huge no-no in general, right? So if you go up to somebody and say, I want to raise money for my company, I want to sell you some equity, uh, you're going to go to jail. Well, you're not going to go to jail. Nobody will know about it. But realistically, if somebody finds out about it, you're going to be in trouble, right? So traditionally, what you would do before break CF, equity crowdfunding, uh, is you only talk to what are called accredited investors. Accredited investors are people who have a high net worth, about 250 grand, I believe. Uh, or a family income of 300, not including the value of their primary residence. Uh, it's a very small group of people. It's about 7% of the population in the United States. So if you don't go through this equity crowdfunding mechanism, if you want to raise money, you can only talk to about 7% of the people in the United States, if you can find them. So as part of 2012, because of the emergence of product crowdfunding and all the successes, uh, the Obama administration decided to enact equity crowdfunding. And that's a lot of that what we're going to talk about today. So let's, let me circle back um, a little bit, talking about crowdfunding in general. But let's talk about startups. Crowdfunding is for startups, whether it's product crowdfunding, whether it's equity crowdfunding. 
That's a very important distinction to make. It's not for established companies. IBM cannot do a crowdfunding, at least not successfully. That's not their thing. Uh, come on in, come on in. Grab a, grab a worksheet. Yeah. yeah, grab a worksheet. Yeah. Okay. So let's, let's go through this exercise. I'm going to name a type of company and you're going to tell me if you think it's a startup. Okay, not a specific company, but an archetypical company. Okay, an independent accountant. Is that a startup? A healthcare app. Is that a startup? Okay. Um, a, a small law firm of three people. No? Yes or no? Well, does it weigh more on the yes or the no? Okay. All right. Well, I mean, everything is kind of a mix, but yeah, I mean, just, you know, general idea. Um, uh, warehouse automation robot. Is a startup? Yeah. Sounds like a startup, right? Um, a college. Okay. Um, let's say a website that gives you links to news articles. Maybe, right? It's kind of, mm, doesn't sound like a good idea, but it's, <laughs> most startups aren't, right? Um, <laughs> um, okay, let's say a subsidiary of a large company that's doing something super innovative. All right, let's say Ford wants to make electric skateboards, and they start a company, a subsidiary, that makes electric skateboards. Yes, no, no, no? Well, raise your hand, yes or no? Raise your hand. Yes, yes for yes, yes for it, hands. Uh, I think most people are in the no or don't care category, so. <laughs> okay, so there's something, right? There's something that clicks in your head, right? And let's define what that is, right? If I say pizza shop, you say no. If I say app, you say yes, right? So there's something there, right? Now, a lot of these are kind of preconceptions, right? Because we've been kind of taught what a startup is. But I'm gonna define it. And I'm going I'm to try to put uh, my finger on what I think defines an app, a healthcare app, as a startup, and a pizza shop as not a startup. A small business like a pizza shop or an independent accountant or a service provider of that, of that ilk, there's a proven approach to a proven market, right? If you open a pizza shop, you know you will sell some pizza. You can model, more or less, how much pizza you're going to sell. You know there's demand for your product. You know that there's something called product market fit. That's kind of a buzzword in the startup world. I think for a startup, that is not necessarily there. As a component of that not being there, you generally don't know the pricing. You know how much a pizza should cost if you open a pizza shop. There's plenty of things you can benchmark to. If you open, if you have an app, you don't know how much to charge generally speaking, depending on the app and how much of a commodity product it is. So I think one of the key components is what's called product market fit. You don't know if your solution fits a market. Another component of that is you don't know if your solution works. You don't know if it's better than whatever there is out there already. And this seems silly, but this has to be a necessary component of innovation and of startups, I believe. Whatever it is that your idea is, and raise your hand if you have an idea. And that's, that's almost everyone here. <coughs> if you have an idea, whatever it is, you cannot be certain that it actually solves the problem you're trying to solve. And whatever it is that you're competing with, and I assure you, you are competing with something bigger, stronger, better funded, much more adopted than whatever it is that you're doing, whether you're competing with spreadsheets or you're competing with independent service providers or you're competing with doctors, whatever it is that you're competing with, it is a more established, more proven, uh, more, more normal way to go about solving that problem, right? I think these are all necessary components. Now, a lot of that introduces risk. It, there's a lot of unknowns. Right? A startup is defined by unknowns. Innovation is defined by failure, not by success. 
with all of these things to succeed in your startup, you need to make a thousand right decisions, half of them based on intuition, half of them outside of your control because of market conditions, and half of them because it's things outside of your control like funding. I know there's three halves there, but reality is in fact clean, right? So there's a lot of stuff to control for. Now, that being said, startups are necessary. About 65% of all the net new jobs in the United States come from small companies, from startups, startups and small businesses. Open up the, um, the page I asked you guys to rip off. It has some stats. Now, to succeed as a startup company, the bottom line is, and I know there's going to be people who will tell you otherwise, but the bottom line is that you need money. Right? You need to be able to buy hamburgers. You need to be able to buy people, services. You need to buy web hosting. You need to buy whatever it is that you need to buy. You need money for it. Most startup founders don't have money. Some do, and I think a lot of those self-funded, you know, I'm bootstrapped on $50 million that I made from my last company, people are not actually startups because that element of risk isn't there. Now, most people here, most people in the startup world do not have enough money. And by enough money, I mean like two years of not paying yourself. That's a lot of money, right? So you not only do you have to be really dedicated but knowing all of the risks and going into it, you also have to be really stupid. I mean, it, it's, it's silly, right? You can go out and get a real job. The economy is great. Whatever it is, you can work at McDonald's, you're going to make much more money than you would in your startup in the next two years. Just being honest. So, why, right? Why do you have a startup? Right? It's crazy risk. So, the only way, if you have an idea, and, and a lot of people here raise their hand when they have a startup, they have an idea is because you believe in it. You actually believe all of these things which can go wrong and you can fix them, you have the right approach. Again, this takes arrogance, this takes stupidity, uh, this takes perseverance, this takes a lot of good words and a lot of bad words. It's, it's a whole salad of stuff that you have to wade through and it's gonna take you years to do it. But the bottom line is you need money. Sources of capital for startups. Now look, look back at that worksheet that I sent you guys, that I gave you guys, that table on the first page that I asked you guys to rip out. The number one source of funding for companies, so first let me start at the beginning. Each month in the US, there's about 565,000 new companies. 565,000 new ones. And I'm not talking about, you know, you probably don't know of any of them. I mean, the Ubers and Facebooks and Airbnbs or whatever, they're rare. They're not startups, right? They're, that's, they call them unicorns because they don't exist, right? I mean, they don't. So let's be real what a startup is and where startups get money. The by far, the vast majority of startup money comes from your personal savings or family and friends. By far. Um, let me see. Oh, yeah. So I have numbers here. About 57% of all companies are funded through personal savings and credit. That's credit line. That's credit cards. Right? If you have a house, it's your home equity line. 38% uh, are funded by family and friends. So that's it. That's, that's pretty much. If you want to look at this statistically, that's where money for startups comes. It's not crowdfunding. It's not VCs. It's not venture capital. It's not angels. If you look at angels, uh, they fund a small amount of startups, but a very specific type of startups. Venture capital funds an even smaller amount of startups. And a lot of those startups are not the type of startups that we would have here. There would be, when biotech, there'd be spin outs of universities like MIT here. That's kind of more the, the thing for venture capital. For, for innovation ideas that we're talking about here, um, VC do not come early stage. So you can basically forget about them. Um, Angels sometimes do, if you find the right person, but again, that's only about 7% of the population. You cannot talk to everybody. These are accredited investors. Sometimes they gather around in groups, but good luck marketing your company uh, to 7% of the population, right? There's no, there's a, it's very difficult to approach that, right? To identify who are eligible investors. And 7% of the people are, can invest. They don't necessarily invest. As far as people that invest, there's only, I got a number here, 
270,000 in the United States. 270,000 people are angel investors, as in they made an angel investment in the United States. That's tiny, right? If you look at venture capital, uh, 462, 462 VC firms. Now, some of these numbers may be a little off. I mean, they come from different sources, right? But we're talking about tiny little amounts of people. Uh, if you look at crowdfunding, the two types of crowdfunding that I'm talking about, pretty much everybody in the United States is a potential investor. The same people who would buy your product can invest in your company. In equity crowdfunding, and the same people who buy your product can pre-order your product, which is a type of investment, for product crowdfunding. So imagine the difference between marketing to a tiny percentage of the United States versus marketing to everybody in the US. One of the reasons that we're startups is because we don't know who our investors are either. Your securities, your stock, your bonds, whatever you want to sell to investors are a product. And you have to think of it that way. It's a product just like the primary product you're selling. Whatever widget it is that you make, that's one thing that you're selling. The other thing you're always selling is your stock. There's two things. Every company has two things to sell. Failure in selling either one of those two things fails your company. As a company leader, you're always selling both. And they're both related. Success in one leads to success in the other. Now, if you take a marketing class, if you take a business class, if you take any class, and See, there's some random business words on this wall here when I walked into this classroom. If you take any of these classes, they treat these things separately, right? Sales has always been separate than fundraising. You, take, you go to talk to anybody in Cambridge, right? There's going to be a conversation. You open around, you close around. This is how you do this. This is how you do that. And then you go sell your product, and then you have to sell, show sales traction for the VC to invest in you. That's not how it works in reality. In reality, you're always selling both things. Success in one leads to success in the other. But you always have to remember you have two products to sell. One product, your product, the thing that you physically make or this, the service that you sell, you sell to the demographic that you know that you're comfortable with, that you tailor your product to. Your securities, you're selling blindly. You don't know who's going to buy your securities. Your, these investors are just as picky as your customers. They're very specialized in the kind of niches and the kind of investments they make, right? Just like your customers, if whatever thing that you sell, if you walk up to a random person on the street, chances are they're going to say no, right? Because it's not the thing they're looking for. I don't care how good and universal your product is, right? I mean, honestly, if 1% of the people in the United States really want your product, you have a massively successful company, right? Right? You agree? Right? So if you go to 100 people on the street, one of them might say, yes, that's awesome, congratulations. Imagine doing that with investors. Imagine how much time, effort you have to put in to talk to 100 investors to maybe get one of them to show interest. That's inefficient. And that was the system before 2012. Equity crowdfunding lets you talk to everybody, all the investors, all the people, accredited investors or not, to see who's likely to buy your security, and then you can tailor your message better through traditional marketing approaches. So how many people ha here have done marketing on Facebook, for example? Raise your hand. OK, that's, that's a lot of people. Um, raise your hand if you've done marketing through print or through pub uh, public relations. OK. Now, you have all done this, and I guarantee it, to sell your product. Right? You have not put out an ad on Facebook saying, buy my security, right? buy my stock. You have not put up an ad in a newspaper saying, invest in my company. You have not. If you have, you wouldn't be here. You'd probably be locked up somewhere. <laughs> right? But you can. You can now. And that's really the big difference. You can use traditional marketing approaches, best practices, like Facebook, to market your security. And that's a revolutionary thing. People vote for your success now. Not elite investors that you really can't reach, but people, actual people who might be your customers. Imagine if Facebook, when Facebook was launching, if you said, I really like Facebook. I want to buy some stock in it. Could you do that when Facebook was launching? No. 
How many people really liked Facebook when it was launching? A lot of people, right? That's why it's Facebook, right? Or Uber, or any of these companies that are synonymous with innovation and disruption and all that kind of jazz, right? If you could invest, you might have. But that opportunity wasn't available to regular people. That was only available to very elite investors. Now it's available to regular people. So now, if a company goes through this equity crowdfunding process, and you like them, you can invest in them. You can invest in Facebook before it was Facebook. You can invest in Uber when it was two guys in a garage, and you think, damn, that's a good idea. Now, I'm not saying that is that should be your entire investment strategy as a person, but that could be one way to diversify. So with equity crowdfunding, we've raised over a million bucks with equity crowdfunding. One of the things, what trends that we see is more sophisticated investors are starting to invest. Traditional angel investors see these crowdfunding offerings as being very indicative of future success. And we've seen this. We've seen uh, um, returns on crowdfunding offerings way outweigh returns on angel investment. And angels know this, right? So if a thousand people invest in a company with money, to buy security, that's a pretty good indication that your company is worthwhile, right? And that's more indication than an angel investment or a VC would have just by doing diligence with a couple of dudes in a basement, which is what happens. It's just, it's intuition. Let's go back, talk about a little bit more about that, and we're gonna get to our first exercise uh, in a second. So if you, if you have this page, leave it in front of you because you're gonna refer to this one. I'm gonna give you some fun facts. And with that, that, which leads us to our first exercise. Um, so if you go to exercise one, it says fun facts. I'm gonna read you some fun facts about traditional venture capital investing. And then you're gonna think about this and you're gonna give me some ideas of what, what comes to mind. So in, over in 2016, about four, over 40% of all venture capital investments came from San Francisco. But regulation CF investors, which is equity crowdfunding, came from every state in 86 countries. 40% of venture capital investment, the traditional way to fund a company, came from San Francisco. All right, that's interesting. Fun fact. Accredited investors make up 8% of the US population, but hold over 70% of the nation's wealth. Over 95% of investors on regular CF, equity crowdfunding, are unaccredited, um, as in they're everybody. So 8% versus everybody. And this is my, one of my favorite facts. In 2016, only 4% of deals in Silicon Valley, where most deals are made, went to women. 4%. 4% of venture capital investment goes to companies that are run by women. 4%. Less than 1% goes to companies that are run by black people. Less than 1%. Now, this is not indicative of the startup world. The startup world, and there's numbers in here, is pretty diverse. Investment is not. And that's something to always keep in mind. So look at the table here. And er, er, there's some blank spaces here. Everybody pull out another couple of fun facts from these statistics. And I'm gonna give you a couple of minutes to do that. You guys on the, on the, on the web stream, I'll do that as well. Uh, pull out a couple of fun facts, and I'm going to ask you guys to share them if you find some interesting ones. So I'm going to give you a couple of minutes, okay? So I'm going to read you some fun facts that I found on this worksheet. But you guys keep working. Don't look, don't look up at me. Keep reading. So one of the fun, some of the fun facts that I thought of is accredited investors are not the ones buying products, but they are the ones funding companies that sell products. People in the startup world are not experts because they understand a topic well. They're experts because at some point they understood a topic well. As soon as you become a VC, you stop being an entrepreneur. So your knowledge is outdated. The top predictor of startup success is the amount of funding a startup gets. If you want to model success, it's about how much money you raise. It seems circular, but that's just entirely it. The more money you're able to raise, the more successful your startup. And the top predictor so how much funding your startup gets is the race and gender of the founding team. I'm gonna repeat that one more time. The top predictor of a startup success is how much funding a startup can raise. The top predictor of how much funding a startup can raise 
is the is the is the race and gender of the founding team. I'm going to give you another couple of minutes, and if you guys found some fun facts, I'm going to ask the crowd. And you guys on the live stream, uh, look through it as well. See if you can find some fun facts. Okay, who's got a fun fact they want to share? Yes. The average funding per company was, say again? 282,000. 282, versus 75,000 for angel, for equity crowdfunding. The average funding amount for equity crowdfunding was about four times more than the average funding that an angel was putting. Yes, that's a great fun fact. Yes. Um, <coughs> 600 million dollars in product or reward crowdfunding versus 114 million in equity crowdfunding. Uh, you know what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna maybe. No, no, no. Hold on, hold on, hold on. You know what I'm gonna do? I think I'm gonna walk around maybe with this microphone. Can you tell me if you can hear people speaking into this microphone? Because that's gonna go up on the big speaker. Okay, say that again. So the annual funding amount for equity crowdfunding is $114 million versus $600 million in product or reward crowdfunding. Great fun fact. Can you hear that on the live stream? Okay. More fun facts. Oh, let me, let me So $114 million in annual found funding amount for equity crowd funding versus $600 million in product or reward crowd funding. Good. More fun facts. Yep. So angels for the year funded less than 1% or 0.91% of new companies. This is a very small number. Equity crowd funding in one year with 1,200 companies was 0.017% versus personal savings of 57% of all new companies. Yes. Yes, so equity crowdfunding does not fund as many companies, right. but the ones it does, it funds with a lot, a lot more. Okay. More fun facts. I'm gonna walk around to you. Equity and product crowdfunding amounts are in the millions. The uh, angel venture and families are in the billions. So there's a lot less to compete over. Yes. It also depends on how much money you need to raise. You actually hit on a really good point. Venture capital and angels tend to invest in companies that have revenue and that have a proven business model. And they need to raise a lot more money, but for very different reasons. So a lot of this is what's called growth capital. So you need to invest in inventory, you need to invest in market expansion, but you have a proven business model. Early stage companies don't need to raise that much. A lot of early stage companies can do a lot with 50 grand or 100 grand, a lot. But that money isn't available to them for VC or angel. So the amounts you raise are very different. The amounts you need are very different. And they're very indicative of the size and uh, maturity of your company. That's a really good fun fact. Who else has something? Yep, I'm gonna walk around to you. The equity crowdfunding is uh, concentrated in 46% of it's concentrated in 10 metropolitan areas. Yes. So I don't know what the 10 me metropolitan areas are. I assume Boston is one of them. Boston is one of them. New York, Boston, San Francisco. Yes. Uh, equity crowdfunding um, and product crowdfunding, they're concentrated in the larger areas, but they're very related to the population of the United States. If you look at where um, venture capital and angel capital is concentrated, they're concentrated in some population centers, but they're primarily concentrated on the coasts. So if you have a company that you're starting in the Midwest, you don't have access to the same amount of angels as you would here in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Oh, yes, go ahead. Yeah. Sure. Um, the, the number of active investors are 800,000 in equity um, crowdfunding in comparison to um, angel investors that's 270 or even venture capital that's 462. That's right. That's a lot more, right? Yes. Yep. The companies launched each month 
over 500,000 and not on this sheet, but previously mentioned the accredited investor is 250,000. So almost twice as many startups launch per month than available accredited investors. Yes, absolutely. Great point. Yeah, I'm going to walk around here. Okay. What's the time stamp of the equity crowdfunding date? Is, is that 17? Is it earlier? Right. So this is, this is all the, I've tried, it's very hard to get these numbers right, obviously, right? Because a lot of this We're is self reporting. I understand. Balance. The equity crowdfunding, the type I'm talking about, has only been around two years. Right. So these numbers are for two years. Okay? Average of two it's years. Annual average two years. Average, yeah. It's all annualized over two years. But the first year wasn't a full year either. So I tr try to do my best to kind of control for that. Uh, but this is the annualized numbers. Yes. Yeah. Equity, <coughs> equity crowdfunding has the smallest number of investors relative to the potential uh, number of people who could invest. Yes. That, brilliant point. Um, so let me talk a little bit about that. In com combination with the previous comment, in fact, equity crowdfunding is so new that a lot of people don't know about it, right? It's, it's about two years old. My company, we're one of the first companies to raise over a million dollars this way. Right? That's saying a lot. Not because we're particularly brilliant, it's because we found out about it, right? And then there is a very active group of investors, but it's very small, who also found out about it. What I've seen over the last year is more traditional investors are finding out about it. Not regular people, not yet, but it will happen and it is happening at crazy rates. Yes, the opportunity is there, and if you talk to people around you, they would say, hell yeah, I'd buy Facebook before it was Facebook, right? I would do what all these crazy rich Silicon Valley VCs are doing. I have intuition about what's gonna work. And the interesting thing is, your intuition so far over the last year and a half has been better than venture capital's intuition. A thousand people investing in a startup predicts or early data, predicts the success of that startup significantly better than a couple of guys who work for a VC fund in San Francisco. Who, by the way, if you look at your fund facts, are generally white and male, right? Businesses represent a much greater range of people and interests. But the people investing money in them traditionally represent a very narrow group of interests. And they know this, they're very smart people, and they know that they're limited in this way. Uh, that is one of the reasons that they're investing more and more into crowdfunding offerings. More fun facts. Yes, let me walk around. Active investors. Mm -hmm. 20 million people know your product even before. Mm -hmm. yep. <laughs> yes. Well, that's a great point. So we talked a lot about, about equity crowdfunding because there's the biggest, I think, knowledge gap. Um, but product crowdfunding has a crap load of people. Crap load of people. Okay, more fun facts? One more fun fact. Yeah, let's walk around together. The average amount of money that the uh, equity crowdfunding investor has invested is $142.50. Mm -hmm. Crazy, right? Crazy. Imagine. An angel investor investing $100 into your company after you spent like six months convincing them that your company is worth something. This is a guy, he's a typical crowdfunding investor, sees a Facebook ad, but hears about you in an article and says, I really like the idea and I'm going to invest in it. The check sizes are much smaller, the amount of people are much larger, and the community you build is a lot more valuable than a couple of guys in a basement in San Francisco. These are actual people who are rooting for you, who own your stock, who are your potential customers. We have over 1,000 investors in, in equity crowdfunding. We have over 1,600, and you can call them investors, you can call them backers in product crowdfunding. These are actual people. It's about 3,000 people, and these are not our customers. They're not the ones buying our products, really. They're the ones buying either the future of the company or they're, or they're pre-ordering product or something of that sort, but they're, they're the ones who believe in us. We have a lot more customers, too. Yes, let me bring a microphone so to you. With, with traditional investing, you don't just get money, but you get advice as well. Oh, how does yeah, me. Oh, sorry. Yeah, yes. yes. With traditional investing, you get money, but you also get advice as well for growth plans and things like that. Um, how does that work with with um, rich CFs where you know it's just 
Yeah, that kind of smells good. My my opportunity cost is pretty small. Here's 50 bucks, but you, you you're not going to get any advice or guidance from someone that has done it before and yeah. you know, gone down a, a well trodden path. That's where the startup clinics here. In part, yeah. I mean, let me. I have I have angel investors for my current company. I've had venture capital investments from my previous companies. Uh, I have, I, I pretty much ran the gamut from incubators and accelerators investing in my companies to, to venture capitalists to angels. Some of this advice is really valuable. Some of these guys really know what they're doing, right? And they can open doors, but there's also a cost. The difference, I think, and this is a decision that every company needs to make, and this is the second worksheet, it's a great segue to our second uh, um, exercise. One of the decisions a company needs to make, is it worth enough for me to give up control of my company? All of these guys, venture capital, invest angels, all this combination of people, they will take a part of your control of your vision away from you to secure their investment. They'll take a board seat, they'll have what are called covenants or protective provisions in, in, you know, in their terms, all that kind of stuff. And they come in many, many different ways. Now, they, some of them provide value, some of them do not, and it really depends on the investor, uh, but they will all take some sort of control. With equity crowdfunding, it's up to you how much control you give to the crowd. Now, we have, like I said, over a thousand equity crowdfunding investors, and some of them have opened doors for us. Some of them have made introductions to us that we would never have been able to make ourselves. And I'm talking from personal experience. Yeah, go ahead. Oh, sorry. Was this not on? I'm going to give this to you again. I, no, okay, I'll, I'll repeat the question. I'll repeat the question. Sorry, live streamers. Uh, the, 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 the question was, again, live streamers, sorry. I guess I forgot to turn this on. Uh, the question was, with traditional venture capital and angel investing, there's a lot of auxiliary benefits to having that investor on your side. There's a lot of guidance, a lot of strategic vision, a lot of introductions that those institutional, more traditional investors can do. They've been through it, they've seen the pitfalls, they can help you, they can make introductions. There's a lot of value that a traditional investor can bring to your company. That is not necessarily the case with angel investors. Well, oh, with the, I'm sorry, with equity crowdfunding investors. But in addition to what I was talking about earlier, you also don't have the maintenance element of it. Right? With, with traditional investors, with angels and VC, there's a lot of accounting, there's a lot of reporting, there's a lot of fielding questions, there's a lot of work to make that relationship happen before the first investment comes in, and there's always you have to maintain that relationship, which, which is fine because it's that, that mode of investment. With equity crowdfunding, these guys look at you like you're a public company, like you're Apple. Right? My angels will email me and ask me questions regularly, which is fine, but they will email me and ask me questions. Equity, and that's, that's how they see the world, and that's, that's that model. My crowdfunding investors don't really email me and ask me questions. Imagine you buying a stock of Apple. Would you ma email Tim Cook with a question? <laughs> like, how do you do this on the iPhone, right? I mean, I have, <laughs> right? So some of my investors have my product, right? They're not gonna email me. It's like, oh, you know, like, well, this doesn't seem to work well, or what does this like mean, or like, they don't, because that's not the relationship that they entered into. Right? They entered into a more transactional relationship, but if they want to get involved, we always leave room for them. We have ambassadors, we have people who advocate our product, and like I said, we've, we actually got a lot of value of our equity crowdfunding investors. A lot of it is because it's a pretty self-selected group right now. These are people who really care because it's so young. In the next two or three years, when millions of people are investing into these equity crowdfunding offerings, I'm sure that'll get diluted a lot, but there's gonna be a lot more money in it as well. So that's always a trade-off. It's always a trade-off, the control you give up uh, versus the value that you get. Yes. And what? Uh, hold on, I'm gonna walk over to you and not piss off the live streamers. And what responsibility, legal and, and business-wise, do you have to the uh, equity uh, crowdfunders? That's a great question. So with the equity crowdfunding, you do have to go through a little process uh, if you raise under $100,000, and honestly, I think for a lot of startups, $100,000 is a decent amount of money to start. It's a very, very bare bones process. It's basically nothing that you need to be care that you need to do. Uh, if that if, if your offering goes up to 100 grand, if your offering goes up to a million, which is what our offering did, you need to go. You need to have a financial review. 
uh, done by an independent accounting firm and a couple of other things, and then you need to send updates to your investors annually. They're not, they're not the same burdens that a public company would face, but it's like a, a very light, light version of going public, and that's something that the SEC wants to protect investors. I think it's a very reasonable requirement, uh, because these are things that you would have to do for your angels anyway. It's just that now you're more, you have to be more transparent about it because it's a much larger group of people. Um, but again, I'm not a lawyer. You should, if you've got to do this, you would need a lawyer uh, because this is an actual securities offering. Um, but yeah, but that, that's, that's the burden, the regulatory burden that you would take on. Let me, uh, let me walk around to you. So in uh, angel or uh, VC funding, you have to do a, um, company valuation, mm -hmm. and um, uh, we often do whatever we can to make sure the valuation doesn't go down. Mm -hmm. In equity crowdfunding, uh, do you have to do an annual valuation, and what are the implications if the valuation goes down? That's a great question. So what are the reasons, so first of all, valuations in general tend to only be for some sorts of companies. So a lot of companies will raise money with safes or convertible debt where there is technically no valuation. Uh, there's just a valuation cap for future investors. Um, we actually were the first company that raised, no? Is this a word? Shake it less. Shake, oh, sorry. <laughs> sorry. Uh, I will just turn it off. I see these two, these two microphones get bundled up together. I can't separate them. Um, so. You can forego a traditional valuation for a lot of the offerings. We actually sell convertible debt through equity crowdfunding. So we technically don't have a valuation uh, on our first round, um, but that's how we did it. We actually didn't sell it. Now, you don't want your valuation cap to go down either, but that's, that's a different issue. That's not as painful as having a valuation go down. Now, you always just generally, you want your company to always keep being worth more. With equity crowdfunding, you are the one deciding. Right? You're effectively marking to market. Right? And does, anybody, does everybody know what that term means? It's kind of a financial <coughs> term. It's seeing how much you can sell your thing for. Right? So selling the volume, setting the price depending on what the market can bear. Right? Which you don't really do that with, with venture capitalists. Right? There's a lot of asymmetry of information going on with venture capitalists. Right? They know a lot. This one VC firm that you've been talking to for six months, or a year knows a lot more about you than some VC firm that has never talked to you before, right? So you can't really shop around. You can't really go up to like 500 people and say, what do you think my thing is worth, right? With equity crowdfunding, you can decide if I, my company is worth this much, this is how many securities I'll sell, right? Let's say I'm, you know, I wanna make my company worth a million bucks. I think I'm gonna sell you know, $10,000 worth of securities if I'm worth a million bucks. But if I'm worth 100,000 bucks, maybe I can sell 50,000 thousand dollars worth of securities, right? So you're actually seeing how the market responds and that is how you're pricing your security. It's a different model than how public companies price their securities, but it's similar, more similar to that than what you have now. If you were to talk to angels or VC, it's a negotiation. And it's between effectively two or three parties, maybe. And they decide. I mean, they'll, because, I mean, look, you, you have the sunk cost, right? You've been talking to them for six months. They have all the leverage. They have all the money. Right, so they can set your valuation for you and pretty effectively, right? Again, I'm not talking about the unicorns, I'm not talking about you know, Ubers and stuff like that. They can go to 1,000 VCs and they'll all you know, compete to give them more money. We're talking about actual startups. So you don't set, in a, in a traditional model with angel investors, they really set your price for you, which is not necessarily a bad thing. I mean, one of the things you have to consider is that as a startup, before you have any money or revenue, you're really not worth anything. Right, so whatever number they put on is really indicative of how much they believe they can make from it. Right, and, and realistically, the more the better, right? So your equity in the, in the early stages is worth zero. And you're trading that zero for money, right? You're monetizing that security product that you have, that stock. You're saying, my stock is worth this, just like your widget is worth this, right? Except that now you can go to the market with equity crowdfunding. You can go to the market and say, my widget is worth this. What are you willing to pay for it? and the market gives you feedback like they would on your product, right? If you have your product, let's say I'm making these lab mics and I want to sell them, and I go to one guy and say, this is a million dollars, you want to buy it? And the guy says, no, right? 
And then I go to three more guys, and they say no. And I'm like, all right, well, I'm kind of screwed now. If I put an ad on Facebook and say, how much would you pay for this lab mic? And the common response is 50 bucks. I know what to sell this for, right? And that's, that's effectively how you, you can set valuation and equity crowdfunding security. You go to the crowd and say, how much are you going to give me? How much do you think it's worth? It's a more democratizing way to set a valuation. Uh, you also don't want it to go down because of just mechanisms that are generally built into offerings. But then again, there's no, you can also build in the provisions that get triggered with your valuation going down because you're the one crafting the security. You're the one deciding what the market wants. Yes, let me walk over to you. <coughs> I wasn't quite sure the process that you're referring to. Are you really doing an ad process to get an idea of what it might be worth and then setting a price, <coughs> or are you setting a price in advance and pushing it out for equity crowdfunding? Which happens? Which order does this happen? Perfect. So just like a product, that's a great question. Just like selling a product, you just kind of have a feel of what the first asking price for that product is going to be. Right? But again, you're a startup, you don't really know. Right? So I'm going to say this is worth a million bucks. And then I'm going to go to the market. I'm going to go to these crowdfunding investors. I'm going to get no investment. Then I'm going to say, okay, you know what? I changed my mind. Now it's worth 50 bucks. It's about making that offer. It's about making that ask. So you go to the crowd and you ask them, will you give me 100 bucks? Will you give me 50 bucks? Will you give me 10 bucks? It's kind of like an auction in a way. But that's how you would do it. But you get a, you, you get a, you get a response that's all over the lot. I, I'll give you this, somebody else will give you that. Yeah, somebody. and you figure out what the best balance for the price versus what you get for it is. Then you set it, and then, then you go out for the actual offer. Exactly like you would think of a product. That's exactly like you would think of how much your product should cost. Okay. You've got to think of your security as a product, just like your other products. You know, in, your, in your convertible debt, what were your levers that you were moving around? Well, our crowd offering? Oh, so the question was... In, in our convertible debt crowdfunding offering, what were the levers we were moving around? So our convertible debt was very straightforward. Uh, we had a $10 million valuation cap, and it converted 20% interest. Uh, sorry, it's, it's uh, yeah, 7% interest and a 20% discount. So basically what that means is if we raise money, you know, a certain amount of money, I think it was $5 million, at below that $10 million valuation, the investor gets a 20% discount off that uh, of whatever valuation we get. If we don't, they convert a 10 million. But these are all mechanical things that um, you, can, you can build in whatever you want. But we didn't give up any board seats. You know, we didn't give up crazy amounts of control because that wasn't built in. We could have if we wanted to. We could give the crowd as one entity a board seat, but we didn't. Yes? Um, I'm curious. So hold on, hold on, hold on. I'm curious if you're familiar with debt crowdfunding. Mm -hmm. And I'm curious. The largest amount of funding um, is coming from personal savings and, and credit. I'm interested if is that more credit than personal savings than is that related to debt? Because I know debt crowdfunding is also mm -hmm. related. It is, yeah, yeah, yeah. All crowdfunding. Yeah. I'm not I'm not spending a lot of time. I know a oh, little okay. bit about yeah. it. I'm not gonna spend a lot of time yeah. on debt crowdfunding. Mm -hmm. uh, because it's a it's a it's a different mechanism. It's a loan. It's a it's a non convertible debt instrument. Um, basically if you've taken loans from a crowd that and you're gonna pay them back either in royalty or whatever. Um, yes. So it's a very viable way to do it. I think the easiest thing, the least burdensome thing for a startup to do is to sell equity, um, to sell stock. Uh, but that's my personal opinion, because there's no, that long-term liability isn't there. Or it's much easier. Uh, let me walk over to you. And then we're gonna get to our next exercise. All right, so my question is, with, with equity crowdfunding, how does it work when you're trying to sell to Let's say an institution, like if you have a product, maybe you're selling like a ball for kids, it's easy to get that price. But if I'm selling a product to universities, how would that work in getting them on board as a crowdfunding? I mean, is it the same method or would that, was that a little different? Okay. So this is, let me talk a little bit about the difference between product and equity crowdfunding. You make a really great point. Um, you can target your investors, right? Just like you would, you know, let's say you, you advertise on Facebook, you can pick the type of people you advertise to. So you can pick the type of people you advertise to. You can reach out to everybody in a school or whoever and say, invest in my equity crowdfunding offering. Or, that's selling your securities, or you can reach out to everybody in a school and say, buy or pre-order my thing, whatever my product is. What's your product? It's, it's EdTech ideas, it's almost for like, um, 
Is it a software product? Yeah. Okay. So, so you can say, and you, do you have it built already or not? No. Okay. So you can say, pre-order my software product at a discount or whatever the mechanism is and help fund my company that way. You're selling product. Or you can say, buy a stock in my company because in the future we're going to be worth more and that's selling your stock. Now, both of these things, you can target to specific people. Now, this is actually the exercise that we're going to do now. We're going to decide what do you think you're going to have a better chance of doing? Selling the future of your product, as in buy my software is going to be personally useful to you, or selling the future of my company. Buy my company is going to be worth more in the future. Okay, so that's exercise two. You, is there any reason you probably both? No, nope, there's no reason, but we're gonna, for the purposes of this exercise, we're going to take it one at a time. Can I ask a question before that? Yes. Is there a crossover in these different funding mechanisms? I'm, I might be mistaken, but I've seen like bank-sponsored equity crowdfunding, but they're looking for accredited Yes, so the question is, yes. There's and they'll give you calculators to, based on your sales and you know, length Yes. Business. Yes. You know, what's so your evaluation? There's a, that's a great question. The question is, is there a crossover or kind of hybrid funding mechanism? And I think another part of the question is, do companies do multiple types of fundraising at the same time? So can you get money from angels and VCs and personal savings and things like that? So the answer to both of those questions is yes. Uh, there's plenty of hybrid things. There's something called venture debt, for example, which is a kind of a bank loan in combination with a venture fund, with a venture investment. There's, there's a lot of these hybrid processes around. So yes, this is kind of deconstructed and simplified. But in reality, it's, the funding world is more complicated than it is on this chart. OK, so let's look at exercise two. Now, I have noticed that there's two exercises, too. So we're going to look at the first exercise, too, which is called decide why and if you want to crowdfund. All right. So if you want to crowdfund, just write an idea about why you think it makes sense. You need the money. You need the community. You need the marketing. What is it? You want to pre-sell your product and get a group of users to beta test? Right? Do you need some users on your software platform? You want some people using your widget to make sure it works? You want to test to make sure that there is a market for your product? What, what, what are you trying to get out of it? Do you actually want to do a crowdfunding offer? Now, so far, I've been talking about the good parts of crowdfunding. You get money, you get esteem, you get community, everything's great, you're lucky, you know, everything's good. The bad part of crowdfunding is it can cost some money. You need to have a budget, we'll go into that. Also. Because of transparency, now everybody talks about transparency like it's a good thing, but it's actually not a good thing at all. If you suck. <laughs> it's awesome if you're really good. If you suck, it's horrible. If you screw up a crowdfunding offer, equity or product or whatever, you're kind of screwed, right? Everybody, your customers, your investors, everybody in the future is going to look at you and you're going to say, damn, nobody likes that thing. I'm not going to like it either. It's that element of social validation. If you hit it out of the ballpark and everybody loves it, then that social validation works for you. You get to the news, investors you know, are running to give you money, users are downloading your thing, everything's good, Shark Tank calls you like they called us, right? It's good. If you screw up, it's really, really bad. Imagine somebody, nobody investing in your crowdfunding offer. Imagine how horrible that would be. Yes. So the, the sharks turned you down after the million dollars was in the bank? Which million? Oh, no, this, this is before the equity crowdfunding. They, we, we actually shot on tar Shark Tank a while before the era. It was a long, long time. So, all right, so you successfully raised after the sharks turned you down? Oh, yeah. Okay. yeah. Which is not uncommon. Um, but anyway, so give that thought. That is really the biggest cost to crowdfunding, is the transparency. So if, 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 yes. you, if you go out with the crowdfunding, say you ask a million dollars for the uh, microphone um, and you're unsuccessful, uh, can you go back out and is that looked at against you? I mean, can you just so the question is, can you keep taking shots in which case it's not as bad a risk? 
So the question is, I'm going to just repeat the question. Uh, if you do a crowdfunding and you screw up, can you do it again? Uh, are people going to look down on you? Is it going to hurt your chances? The answer is yes and no. It depends on the people. Some people are fine with that. Some people will invest in you when you figure it out, when you do something better. Uh, I mean, realistically, any time anybody knows of you is a good thing, right? Even if they don't invest in you, right? If they hear your name, if they make that consideration, and if you can address whatever issue was holding you back, I think it's a good thing for a lot of people. It's a bad thing for the more traditional investor types. So if one of your goals is after you do your crowdfunding product or equity, is to raise venture capital or money from traditional sources, which, I mean, realistically, they provide, they're very, that's a very valuable avenue to take to raise money. I'm not dumping on them. It's a, they provide a very valuable service. But it's one of the tools that you should have as a startup. It shouldn't be the only tool. Um, it can hurt you with them. They will look at you and say, they didn't nail it, they didn't hit it out of the park, the chances of me making my 10x return is much slower now. So I think it depends on the kind of people you're targeting. I, far, I think as far as customers, customers are pretty forgiving. And, yes. And for transparency, it occurs to me that uh, one of the things that's good about angels or VCs is this private equity, so I'm not revealing a lot of the company's secrets. Yes. Um, with crowdfunding, is, is that an issue? The question is, is the transparency, disclosing your financials, um, is it, does it give you a disadvantage? in the marketplace. With private equity, uh, you don't tell everybody in the world what you make, right? You, d you don't disclose this, right? Your cap table is nice and tight and your financials are top secret. There's two different schools of thought on this. Uh, my school, so I'll, I'll give you one school of thought, is letting your competitors or other players in the market know how much money you make and what your weaknesses are because you disclose them uh, is a bad thing. And I think a lot of people would agree with that on the space value, right? Disclosing your revenues and weaknesses is a bad thing. I think as a startup, that is the least of the problems you have. The biggest problem you have is getting money. Honestly, you're not actually competing with anybody who's in a position to compete with you as a startup. But I know this seems hard to understand because you think that the startup that's doing more or less the same thing that you're doing that's sitting right next to you is something you're competing with, you're not. You're competing with the established way of doing things. And that, that way is run by IBM and SAP and whoever. You're not competing with other startups. You're not competing. It's good for them to think you're dinky because they won't worry about it. Ex it's, that's a good point. Or it's good for them to be afraid if you're making a lot of money. I don't think it's a disadvantage. And honestly, every time I think having connection, a genuine vulnerable connection, Let's say you screw up, you have a horrible year, you do something really bad, and you're vulnerable. That vulnerability to consumers and to equity crowdfunding investors might be a good thing. Now, this space is too young, but if, I, if I've seen as far as what connections look like, as far as social media, as far as just you know the general way of connecting with people, vulnerability makes you connect with someone better, not worse. Now, obviously, it's good to always win, but losing is not necessarily a bad thing. And if you're striving for that genuine connection with your customer or for your investor, I think that honesty, that forced, blatant honesty, and if you're not honest, you have real legal problems, you have to be honest. I think in a lot of ways, it's a very good thing. But there are two different schools of thought on this. Does showing a vulnerability, is showing a vulnerability a good or a bad thing? It's too young to know quantitatively, um, but I believe it can be a very, very good thing as well. Yeah, let me, uh, yeah, go ahead. Well, quick question. Um, when you're when you're pitching, let's say you're not pitching any large scale knowledgeable investors, you're going to go on a crowdfunding basis, and you're going to go on a particular market segment that you want, or a group of individuals you want. Pick whatever you want, exercise people, runners, wh whatever you want to pick, and you pitch your crowdfunding to a group. How important is your mission if it's a health issue, as opposed to what you're trying to accomplish in terms of return on? Again, I think it really depends on your product and who you think your investors are. Some people invest on mission, on vision. Uh, some people invest on social impact or how green your product is or how much they'll help the world. Um, benefits, the benefit to society and whatever.
definition of that is. Some people invest because they want to make money. So I think it, it so, I mean, I've seen investors, but that's the thing. It, it, you can choose who your product is targeting. You really can't do that with angels. Angels want to make money. That's, that's all they do. So if your product has a public benefit of some sort, you're not angel qualified. That's not your thing. Angels are not going to invest in that. Um, and it doesn't matter if you're a for-profit or a non-profit. It's completely irrelevant to this, right? If, if you have some kind of a mission-driven idea startup, uh, your investors might not be the traditional I want to make money investors. Your investors might be the I want to do a public benefit investor. And you can target. You can target which people you want. And not everything is for everyone. But then again, with, with uh, equity crowdfunding, you can literally reach out to a million people and decide where is the where is my message sticking the best, which you can't do with, with traditional investment sources. All right, so let's do the exercise. Uh, write down a couple of ideas about if you want to do crowdfunding, why you want to do crowdfunding, and what type of crowdfunding you think you'll start with. Product or equity crowdfunding? Again, product is selling your product, your stuff. Equity is selling your securities. So write down a couple of thoughts about whether you want to do crowdfunding, knowing all the risks and challenges, uh, and what kind of crowdfunding you want to do. Do you want to sell your products, or do you want to sell your securities? And there's benefit to both. But let's do one at a time because, you know, we all have limited resources. We can only do one. You guys in the live stream, you please do this exercise as well. Uh, if you have ideas, send them in. Okay, if you have any questions, raise your digital hand. Key this exercise is thinking of your securities just like you think of your product. It's another thing you sell as a company. Think about that. You're always trying to sell your securities and you're always trying to sell your product. In the end, they both translate to money. And that's what you need. Let me give you another minute. Just write down what your gut tells you. I'm going to go around the room. Okay, so I'm going to walk around with a mic. Raise your hand if you want to say something. I'm going to ask you to very quickly introduce yourself, your company, or your product. And then I'm going to ask you to let me know what you want to do, if you want to do anything. Even if you don't want to do crowdfunding, let me know. Uh, let us all know. Um, if you want to do crowdfunding, let us all know, and the type of crowdfunding. Now, one distinction I want you to keep in mind when you're introducing your project is a startup is not an invention. It's not something you invented. We invent something all the time, right? I invented a new way to cross the street this morning. <laughs> inventions are not valuable. When inventions become products, right, when you invent a pen, something that becomes a pen, then you make a pen, that's a product. That's not what I'm asking about either. When a product becomes a company, as in when you have a repeatable business model to sell that pen, that's what I'm asking about, okay? You might have invented something great, and that's great. Tell me what it is that you're selling. You might have made a product out of it, as in you found a way to make it affordably and make it productize it. That's great, let me know. But what I'm really asking about is your company, right? The repeatable business model. What is the goal of your company? Now, it's easy to think of product crowdfunding as a product level thing, but it's not. It's still a company, right? Every time you raise money, whether you're selling stuff or whether you're selling securities, you're raising money for a company, not for a product. So just as I walk around, just keep that distinction in mind. I'm not asking about your invention. I'm not asking about your product. I'm asking about your company. You guys get the distinction? Yep. Yep. All right, raise your hand if you want to say something. Let me walk over to you. Uh, Bill Goff, uh, uh, I'm the CEO of Physical Health Insights. Uh, we're at, we uh, intend to 
uh, solve the problem of musculoskeletal health in the United States by providing information as to what the pain that you're feeling is causing, how it's caused, how you can care for it, uh, provide exercise and stretching programs, and the information you need for a physician. We believe in equity crowdfunding for two reasons. We have a specific market we want to go after. We want that market first to understand what the product is, use it, and then be part of the investors so they explain it to other people and expand it that way throughout the world. That's great. That's great. Anybody else? Yeah, I'm going to walk around to you. I know I was told I don't have to go to the side of the road, but I'm going to do it anyway. <laughs> Hi there. My name is uh, Johnny Cato. I am the CEO of Innovative Wellness System. Uh, we are out of Dover, Mass. Uh, one out of ten people in this room will develop a uh, diabetic one. And one out of six of them will end up with uh, diabetic foot ulcers. Our product is a smart insole that goes inside of your shoes, where we alert you in the upset of the DFU. Uh, we have a dilemma. Uh, we are very close to do our first round of business. Now the question is that the product that we have the insole as we see around the country an explosion of diabetic, should we go out and put that product, that insole, to the people that can actually afford it and sell it and get it for the family members? Or do we go to the, you know, just as an equity? Because we see our goal is to sell 20 pairs of insole throughout the United States, split it by 50 states, and then therefore we shot a $200 million company. So we had a dilemma. Uh, as we are very close to this round of financing that we feel that within the next couple of weeks we're gonna have, but we want to expose our company to exposure um, because they are diabetic is a huge issue within the country. So that is, uh, you know. You gotta decide. It's a good, it's a good it's dilemma. It's a bad dilemma. Yeah. There's no right answer. There's no wrong answer. Yeah. It's just answers. Yeah. So whatever you do, your chances of screwing up are higher than the other things. <laughs> <laughs> just so you know. Yeah. Murphy's Law. Yeah. 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 Let me walk yeah. around to you. Well, actually, on theirs, it would fit. Hold on, hold on, hold on. One second. Interesting. It's all healthcare. I'm Doug Williams. Um, I'm advising a healthcare company doing a mobile app, and I was trying to figure out what I'd advise them to do. And um, uh, we're looking at a premium model where um, if we raised a, a million dollars, we'd have to uh, sell 25,000 licenses at $60. You know, so it, it's part of it is how many. Uh, how many you'd have to sell to make the same amount of equity? That's so. That's one thing that's obvious. Um, and then, question for you is, if you did that, would that would that take away from your revenue when you went to raise more money? Um, well, I guess you could count it as revenue. If I mean, pre-sales is, yeah, is right. when it, when you actually ship the product or right. deliver it, it becomes revenue. Yeah. yeah so, it, so actually, given that, then, then I think it'd be a good thing to kind of go both ways. So what, let's assume that you have, I'm assuming the company that you're advising yeah. doesn't have enough resources to do one of these things. They definitely don't have resources to do two of these things. Ah, yeah. So which one of these things do you think you can do? Um, I think uh, what I came away with is um, you could appeal to the population, uh, investors that are interested in the population, so I think I'd go after equity because um, uh, it would be the cross-section of investors that had um, a, a deep interest in solving the medical problem, um, which was kind of where I came away, as opposed to trying to find tens of thousands of, um, uh, of people to purchase it. Yes. Hi, I'm Mark Hill. I'm the founder of the Wardrobe Essentialists, which is a two-sided marketplace connecting men who want to look great but hate shopping for clothes and the brands that serve them. Uh, imagine that uh, Kayak and Pandora had a kid that grew up to manage your wardrobe, scanning the whole online marketplace in an instant and returning with a curated list of items that look the way you want, fit the way you want, complement your current wardrobe so that you could buy online in minutes and never set foot in a store. Um, our business model is free to the end user, so kind of hard to do a product crowdfunding on that one. Uh, so I want to learn more about equity crowdfunding. Thank you. All right, one more from this side, and then I want to go to the other side for a couple of questions, because you guys are way too quiet over there. Yes. Uh, hi, my name's Kamani Jefferson. I'm the president and state house lobbyist for the Massachusetts Recreational Consumer Council. We're a cannabis consumer 501c4 nonprofit. 
um, specifically focused on consumer advocacy and consumer education, um, and also social equity for uh, communities that were disproportionately harmed by the war on drugs. Um, we're leaning more, we've, we've been doing product reward crowdfunding through Patreon, uh, which is more for artists. Um, and for two reasons, we're a nonprofit, so there's no equity involved. Um, there's also more people and more money in reward crowdfunding, and we've had a lot of success. Um, when the time is right, I think when we have to go after bigger, bigger funding, I, I'm very interested in debt funding. I, I, I think um, equity it, it could be problematic. I'm also a man, black man, and I have a Latina co-founder, um, so we see a lot of success with females and ethnic minorities in, in the reward crowdfunding, so I think that that is a huge future for this. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to go to this side. Yes. Uh, hi, my name is uh, Peter Dwyer. I'm the founder of uh, the Young Citizens of the World, which is an educational organization promoting and appealing to parents and grandparents to bring their kids to get immersed and un to learn the culture and language of way more countries than is traditionally the case here in the United States, so that the people who pass through this organization can be true, true leaders of the next generations. Okay, so what do you want to do? So I, I would want to test the market uh, and market to the equity crowdfunding, you know, use equity crowdfunding to test the market and market. Because one of the things is with, if I'm trying to think about uh, marketing to angels, it's not their kid, mm -hmm. place. Yep. But I think it's a great hook for the uh, a significant portion of people who might be out. One more from the side. Hello, my name is Amak Kasmi. I'm the founder of Nova Forma. We're looking for opportunities in the smart home market. Uh, we developed a couple of product prototypes, and we're interested in product crowdfunding to raise funds to help us launch the products and to pay for the tooling. And with any success, uh, we would like to start thinking about equity crowdfunding because we think it has uh, it comes with more responsibility. Uh, with any luck and uh, a lot of hard work, hopefully we'll be the bang of all of them, you know, of the smart home products. Thank you. Okay. So, the ones, the people who didn't speak, do you see some truth in what the other people said about what you're doing? Raise your hand if you do. If there's a lot of overlap between what you would have said and what somebody else had said. Raise your hand, raise your hand. That's a lot of people, right? So the keys are pretty similar, right? The reasons are pretty similar, which leads us into the next exercise. Let's assume you're all here, and it's kind of a self-selective group. You're all here because you want to do crowdfunding, and you want to learn about it. You want to know how it works, the mechanisms behind it, the benefits, the costs, the risks. The next exercise we're going to do, and this is exercise, the second exercise too, is we're actually going to crowdfund. We're going to do a little mock crowdfunding right now. So there's some blanks here. And by the way, this works for the nonprofit world as well. It's slightly different, but it works. It's the same general approach. Um, so budget. I'm, gonna, I'm just going to read through these. You guys keep thinking about them, OK? You, realistically, to do a crowdfunding, you need, on the product side, a little less, probably closer to 10, 20K. You need a production video. You need, if you don't have nothing, you need a website. You need a campaign page. You need some marketing. If you do equity crowdfunding, there's a little bit of legal stuff you have to do. And that, with the marketing, is probably up, of, up to maybe about 50K. You need a pathway to get to that. It's one thing, 10 to 50K. You need a budget. Uh, videos and photos, um, you need video. Video is the medium that is used with the crowd. And these are not commercials. This is not what you'd see Apple. Apple's going to introduce a new iPhone in a few days. right? What they're going to have is a commercial. Commercials do not connect with people. Commercials are what big companies have to do because they can't do anything else. You, as a young company, get to introduce a new revolutionary idea. 
your video genuinely expires, inspires. It doesn't tell you that Tide makes your clothes cleaner than other things. It's inspiring. It's a different brand of video. It's a different brand of message. It's a different brand of connection. You need to be able to articulate that connection. You're introducing a new idea that people don't know about. It's not a, it's not a phone. I'm not going to be inspired by Apple's phone. I'll think, oh, that's a cool camera. But I'm not going to be inspired by it. You need to inspire video. So have some ideas about how you're going to get that video done. And don't. it's not a Mickey Mouse video. It's not, this is your chance. This is how you introduce yourself to the world. Yes? Two questions. One on that is the video, is it, um, when you did yours, was it uh, Michael Bertoff uh, talking to investors or was it Geo or or uh, Orbital feature? Um, uh, and then secondly, back to the um, first point was on the legal side, uh, McCarter's uh, has been doing some focus on ICOs. Are there, um, are there certain uh, law firms that are um, focused on, th on this area, the equity crowdfunding, or uh, is Wilmer and all that just jumping right in? So I'll, I'll repeat your question real fast. Uh, when you're doing the video, do you approach the investors as, hi, this is me, this is my product? Uh, or do you do something else? And I'll answer that. Uh, and the second question, a more tactical question, is are there particular law firms that specialize uh, in crowdfunding and ICOs, which is a type of crowdfunding, I'm not going to get into it, uh, but it's a type. It's also a type of crowdfunding that's been very popular lately. Um, are there specific law firms that specialize in it? So the answer to law firms is yes. Pretty much every big law firm will do it, but it'll cost a lot of money, and I don't recommend using them for that reason. Um, realistically, as a startup, the things you need, uh, smaller firms can do, and you get to save a little money. Um, I don't. Re the big law firms will work with you. They're very good, actually, about this kind of thing. Um, but you know, you might not necessarily need them. I would recommend smaller firms that have, as as if it's your first company, if you're just starting out, it's good to have somebody to talk to. It's good to have somebody smaller to work with. Um, there are, there's definitely, if you you can just Google for it, there's definitely law firms that specialize specifically in equity crowdfunding offerings, and they will templatize the hell out of it. So they will save you time and money. What, this industry is becoming pretty mature pretty quickly. So even these filings, these SEC filings that you need to do are becoming relatively straightforward. They're becoming not boilerplate yet, but there's a few companies that are literally making them a boilerplate wizard. You just fill in some stuff and it files your SEC file. So, so equity is um, going mainstream. The McCarter specialized in ICO and they're, they're now saying they're, it's maybe going away or it's, going, yeah. it's so, going really weird. It was a window in time. So so one's going mainstream through a real law and ICOs were rogue and the SEC's putting them back into a box. It's McCarter view. Yeah, so the, qu the question is um, with ICO specifically, initial coin offerings, are they sticking around? Are they going away? Uh, there, are, there, there are voices saying they're going away. There are voices saying they stick around. Uh, the, the ICOs have always lived in kind of a weird space. Yeah. It's always been a security, but it's always been argued that it's a token and not a security. But the red, but this, the one you're talking about tonight. Yeah, the, red, is, the this going regulation CF is, is there's a legal official process. It's not it's not that type of thing. However, ICOs are, are pretty. ICOs are also a type of crowdfunding. ICOs are a way to. Uh, how many people here know what an ICO is? An initial coin offer. It's like, you've you heard of like Bitcoin and stuff, yeah. right? right? It's basically using a Bitcoin-like thing to raise money, right? I'm not gonna go into the details, but it's always kind of lived in the cracks uh, between legal and illegal and regulated and not regulated. A lot of money has been raised that way, but I don't know, it's not too kosher. Now, the SEC noticed this, that people are selling effectively a security without calling it a security. Uh, and they started cracking down on it. So. Um, the general consensus is that the ICO as we know it is probably going to go away. Uh, that being said, ICOs, the idea of putting securities on a, on a blockchain and trading it with other security holders, that's becoming more and more popular. That's actually going in the other direction. So there's a movement called tokenizing. Um, if you Google this term, uh, you know, there, there's there's a lot of there's a lot of buzz. It's only been a few months, I guess, since, 
since this has started happening. But turning traditionally regulated securities into these Ethereum primarily or blockchain tokens is actually kind of a concept that's taking off. And by the way, the advantage for nonprofits is that nonprofit uh, tokens are a perfectly valid thing to trade. Um, but again, these are all very young things. I wouldn't advocate for any of them because they're still kind of in the gray areas. And the problem with them is that you really need to know a lot about the subject before you can do this. Equity crowdfunding, you don't really need to know anything. You just need to know your company and stuff like that. To do anything on the blockchain, you really need to know, you need to be an expert, you need to have experts. The burden to entry in that type of fundraising is too high for me to advocate it to the average person. Um, all right, so let me, let me go down this list. Let me keep going further. Um, so pick a platform. Uh, the next question, number four, oh, I'm sorry, number three, website and campaign page. Again, your website and your campaign page need to inspire. Don't think of yourself as a commercial. Think of yourself as an introduction. Okay? If you're going up to people and giving a commercial for your company, that's not the best way to introduce a crowdfunding campaign. You need to introduce. When they're selling Tide or iPhones, they're not introducing them. They might use that word, but they're not introducing them. You know that thing, right? They're introducing a feature, or they're introducing whatever, right? That goes back to my earlier. Are, they, are you, did you introduce yeah. yourself? So do I introduce myself? Yes, I think it's generally good practice to say, I'm Mike, I'm this person at the company, introduce the team. Uh, again, you're going for that connection. But there have been very successful campaigns that never introduced themselves either. I personally think it's, it's worthwhile having a connection uh, with your customers or investors, but it doesn't work for anybody. But the element of introduction is there, right? Again, not introducing features, but introducing the concept. So it's big ideas. You're not down in the weeds of, if you press this button, this thing does this. And look at this new feature and whatever. Uh, you're introducing, it's a big idea. The whole thing is a big idea. The page supports your video, and the page introduces a big idea. How is this, even on a product level, on a product crowdfunding level, how is this going to change the world? How is it going to improve people's lives? What is the idea? Why? The global why, not the tactical why. I'm not getting this iPhone because I want a new camera, right? That's not the picture making. You're not saying it has a better camera. You're making the big why. Why am I here? Why are we here together? So that's something to think about on the campaign page. Write down a couple ideas about the why. Um, and then pick a platform. Uh, now, the pick a platform is one that I don't expect you guys to do here right now. Uh, go to all of these. They all have different approaches. Some of these actually are debt platforms that I have listed here. Uh, look at them. Look at their messaging. Look at the kind of companies that have been successful at them. These platforms spend a lot of effort uh, attracting the type of investors that are likely to invest in the offerings. And they become pretty specialized. Some platforms are do more public benefit fo uh, focused offerings. Some of them will do transportation offerings. Some of them do apps. Some of them do other things. Right? So pick a platform that already has a user base of investors, product or equity investors, that are tailored to the kind of thing that you want to do. Yes? Would there be uh, a situation where you did uh, simultaneous <coughs> campaigns on two different sites? So that's a great question. Um, the question is, can you do simultaneous campaigns on two different sites? Generally speaking, it confuses the investor. Uh, because remember, you're every, pretty much what you do drives traffic to wherever you're raising the money. So you don't want to drive it. To, you don't want to bifurcate your traffic. It's just it's 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 difficult from a marketing perspective. Easier to get lost. Right, and, I, and there's not really a huge advantage to it. I don't think. Um, that being said, it goes back to an earlier question, can you do product crowdfunding and equity crowdfunding at the same time? Now, when we did our product, well, we did a Kickstarter. We raised 1.26 million on Kickstarter. I wish I had known and that it was around. Equity crowdfunding was around. I did not know about it and it wasn't around at the time. <laughs> now, if it was around and I did know about it, that would have been a really great combination. Because the same people who were likely to buy my thing might have had a lot of overlap with the people who believe in the future of my company. Mm -hmm. So yes, but the, another caveat is it's really hard and it's a lot of work to yeah. do these campaigns. So as a small team, you really need to pick the one that's best bang for your buck. Yeah. Even if that means saying no to some money. Yes, sir? 
Can you, um, I'll use the three health startups that are sitting here. Um, could you, um, is there a way to offer a discount? Um, like, would you be able to offer a dis discount to practitioners? Um, yes, so the question is, can you give discounts? Or what they call in the crowdfunding world, perks. Yes, absolutely. You can even do it with securities, which is what we do. If you work with us, if you invest over a certain amount of money in our last round, uh, you get a discount off the security. So you basically get more securities for free. You can so do you that. Could, you could get the practitioners behind it by giving them By giving them a discount. A discount on the securities and on the product. Absolutely. Yes? What about like, service uh, crowdfunding? Um, and, and it's there's no end date. Kind of, I don't, I'm aware, every month I'm always crowdfunding. Like, so, I don't know what it's so you always want to be raising money? Yeah. Right. Or if, if it's for a service, it's, it's essentially the customer. Right. Yeah, you can do that. I mean, there's no, the, the space is so young, right. we don't know what works yet. Right, and that's the whole, that's the point of this workshop too, right? I'm not an expert, I'm an expert in this, I, I'm an expert in this one thing I did once. Right, or these couple of things I did a couple of times. It's not the future, right? I don't know what the future is gonna be. You guys don't know what it is. It's gonna be whatever you try. If it works, you, you'll change the world with it. And now you have a tool to do that with. Right? This, this mechanism, this equity crowdfunding mechanism, is that tool. You can use that tool to make new things. It's a hammer. You can build a house, you can build a boat, you can do whatever you want with it, but you can use it now. Somebody invented this tool. Right? And that, that's really the point. Right? If it's the tool you want to use, you can do amazing things with it. Okay? Yes. Um, how can you determine what the ask is? In, in, the, in equity crowdfunding? Or the product. You know, whatever how, we how much money you want to raise? Yeah, it's not enough to run the company. So With product crowdfunding, you don't have a choice? What's that? Oh, you got to repeat the question. Oh, yes, of course. Yeah, how do you determine how much to raise, whether in equity or product crowdfunding? How much money do you need? With product crowdfunding, you basically set your minimum. Well, with both, in a way. But um, you set your minimum, I want to raise 10K. Your minimum should be enough for you to make that thing to make a batch of whatever. If it's a hardware product, that tooling, those expenses that you'd have to incur up front. Uh, if it's software to you know, get the development done, it should be a reasonable amount. Uh, but you don't have a choice. If people buy more of it, they'll buy more of it. Which could be a good thing and a bad thing, by the way. So there's definitely, it's definitely a mixed bag. With equity, it's kind of the same. You always want to set a cap of how much equity you want to sell. Uh, but up until that cap, I mean, as a general rule of thumb as a startup, never say no to money. Money is the one thing you always will always, 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 always need and for, the f for the duration of your company. Money is the one thing that is the entirely, is the thing that is crucial to your success. Like I said earlier, it's the number one prediction of your success as a company. So as a general rule, the more the better. Uh, but you need to be able to deliver. Whatever it is, you need to be able to deliver. There's another few yeah, questions. Who is in charge of um, keeping it all straight um, you know, the investors, you know, you're, you're selling um, securities. Now, how do they get their, um, what, what is the process? Of how does the mechanism work of paying back the the, qu the question is who does the interaction, the diligence, the, the, um, the process of taking the money, issuing the securities in the equity crowdfunding? Now, one of the things that the Jobs Act did is they made uh, the requirement to use a platform. So there are accredited platforms, FINRA accredited platforms, the ones on the list that I gave you, they're all accredited, um, that have been accredited by the SEC and other regulatory agencies to do this for you. They will actually issue the paperwork after somebody buys a security. They will keep a ledger of who bought which security. They'll keep that cap table for you. Um, and they have to do that by the law. So, and that's actually one of the huge burdens of taking investment from angels or whoever, is actually issuing all the paperwork, is keeping track of all the investment and being compliant. The platform does that. And, the pla and you pay fees to the platform for doing that. And they'll range on the low end between 5% of your raise. Uh, and there's some platforms will take 20, 30% of your raise. Uh, but they offer different amounts of services. But it's definitely, they're all on the list. If you go platform by platform, you, you'll, they should, generally they disclose their fee structure pretty well. But yeah, some of these platforms are crazy expensive and they take a lot of that money. 
Some of these platforms are also decided, divided into broker dealers um, versus non-broker dealers, and that's just another distinction that you need to, I'm not gonna go into it too much, but it's one of the reasons that some of them are much more expensive than other dealers. Um, is there another question? Yes. How about uh, B2B? B2B. B2B is tricky. So, crowdfunding in general for B2B products. Product crowdfunding tends to be very tricky for B2B products because the pool of, of potential buyers is so large. Equity crowdfunding has had more success. It's too young to say, but out of those two crowdfundings, equity seems to be the better one. The selling the future of your B2B product to a non-B2B customer, to a non-enterprise customer, is easier than selling your enterprise product to a non-enterprise customer. Um, you can, I mean, there are certain things that, so for example, we sell our product to law enforcement agencies, police departments, all over the country. Um, to, for me to sell that on a Kickstarter, well, we sell it to consumers as well. We're, our primary business is consumers, but we also have a specific public safety model that we sell for law enforcement. Um, if, I was, if that was the only product that I was selling, doing a Kickstarter wouldn't make any sense, right? How many police departments would buy my product through a Kickstarter? Nothing. However, I can argue, I think, the case, I don't know how well, on an equity platform saying, look at all this traction that we have with law enforcement. They're showing a real need for our product. Look at all this cool stuff we're gonna do. Our company is gonna be worth a lot of money. So I think on a company level, product uh, equity crowdfunding is a better fit for B2B. But both of them are harder. They're both harder than consumers just because you're targeting a, type, a different type of person. That being said, if you have really good, what are called Facebook lookalike audiences, or if you've done Facebook marketing, uh, you know what that is, you can probably target that B2B customer. You can target employees at particular companies. You can target people in geographic areas. So there's, there's a lot of advantages to being able to do that public solicitation that I mentioned, to target so, such a large, diverse group of people, and then really narrow it down to the people more likely to buy your enterprise. Any other questions? All right, how much time do we have? Let me go through this. Let me finish doing this exercise with you guys. We're gonna go for a couple more. <laughs> Are there any other, I mean, uh, how easy is it to go public after that for a crowdfunded product or an equity, um, let's say, and you became successful with other one, and uh, you want to take your, your so company So let me give you a microphone, actually. Let me keep the question. Is it, is it to take your company public after that? Uh, I believe you, you became successful after crowdfunding and you, your sales got to the point where you want to go public. And, uh, okay. So okay, let's say you want to do an IPO. Yeah, yeah, that's right. So the percentage of companies who do IPOs is, is it zero. So it's a good problem to have, right? So at some point, let's say you, you want to go completely public, like being listed on an exchange, and I don't know why anybody would want to do that, honestly, these days. Um, <laughs> the, the reason that companies do this is to have access to these capital markets, right? So they can raise from the crowd. But you don't need to really do that, it's, I don't know. So why would you go IPO? I don't know. But let's say you did want to go IPO. Cash out? Well, you can cash out with other mechanisms, too. I mean, you can sell. I mean, people sell their companies by far more common. Let's say you let's say you want to go IPO. There's it's too young to say if there's any complications with having an equity crowdfunding offering, but I don't see any reason there would be. Uh, you just have a lot of investors, and a lot of companies have a lot of investors. Uh, if you're in a position to need to decide whether to go public or not, I don't think I think having a lot of investors in your cap table is the least of your concerns at that point. Because you're gonna have so many other but I mean, you might want to go public, but there's a ter there's another term for equity crowdfunding, and it's called the online public offering, the OPO. And that's effectively what it is. You're having a public offering online. You have access to investors. You're not listed on exchange yet, although think people are working on this, and in the next few years, there might very well be exchange-like things for these very liquid, early stage startup securities. Um, again, it's, it's a little young, but the way things are going right now is that there might not be a need to go IPO when you can go OPO. Yes? Uh, just 
a follow up to that question. So, if you do a crowd equity crowdfunding, will that affect your uh, fundraising from VC later? That's a great question. Can everybody hear that? Yeah. If you do equity crowdfunding, does that affect your ability to raise strong venture capitalists later? Angels, VCs. Unfortunately, the answer is yes. Um, and it's not. It's primarily because of people not being familiar with what it is now. They will look at this thing that you raise money from the crowd and they won't know the effect it'll have on you long term. Even if you have what's called an SPV, like let's say all of your um, crowd investors are just one entry into cap table. So your cap table is clean, there's no complications, everything is, everything is kosher. Investors, traditional investors are still hesitant very young, like I said, it's only been two years, and they're not sure of the repercussions. Right now, accredited investors, traditional investors, are likely to not touch a company that has done an ICO, an initial coin offer. Again, because the burden, the legal burden and the ramifications of that particular mechanism of raising money is pretty heavy, right? But then again, you might not need those people. So, but anyway, ICOs are different because they're not regulated, but it's still kind of the wild west. So if you're looking for traditional money, traditional banker type people, who are very you know, traditional in the kind of investments they make, it might affect your ability to raise from some of them. At the very least, it'll, it'll have, you'll have to answer a lot of questions and there'll be a lot of education you have to do. But yeah, any complication, any deviation of the normal path will complicate. Excuse me. Yeah. To add on that, does it affect SBA loans? The question is, does it affect SBA loans? Um, I haven't seen it have any effect on SBA loans, but most startup companies that we're talking about are not eligible for SBA loans. Mm -hmm. not, so not at this stage, not at this stage. Why? What's that? Why? It's just, you're not gonna get funding for an app or something like that. It's just not the thing. You can get small businesses get right. for things like, that's one of the distinctions that we made between small businesses and startups. And stuff like that. Yes, go ahead. Another question, so like at which stage um, we pass for second equity club? At which stage, like, is you like um, conceptualizing your idea, or that you are um, getting funds from angels, or you're like sort of equivalent to Series A? That's a great question. What stage uh, do you want to look into equity crowdfunding? At what stage are you mature enough to raise money from a crowd? Is it angel stage, Series A stage? I think a lot of it depends on not your stage, but how well you can communicate what you do. Um, you can have nothing. One guy, and this has happened, um, making potato salad. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so you, can, about that. you know about the potato salad? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Potato salad guy. Was making potato salad on Kickstarter. That's awesome. Right? Or, um, As a joke, right? Like, it was a joke. Did he he raised money? like a bunch of money. That's awesome. Uh, you got like can, a half million dollars or something. Right. Yeah. yeah. It's crazy a lot of money. Or you can make a card game with kittens on it. And I was like, you have zero. So the stage isn't that important. The important part is your connection with your, with your customer. Either your customer for your security or your product. Can you make that connection? Now the potato salad guy and all those other fringe cases, they're, they're extremes, that's not gonna happen. If you were to launch a Kickstarter right now with potato salad, you're not gonna do well. Um, but he made a connection. Whatever happened, that guy made a connection. Do, do you, um sign non-disclosure agreement? How does that work if your idea is in its uh, infancy and you just want to crowdfund, create crowdfunding to um, put, um, bring it to maturity? The question is, do you sign a confidentiality agreement, non-disclosure agreement about your intellectual property if you don't want to disclose your idea but you want to develop something that's still a secret? So my general philosophical idea is if you have something that you want to get a patent on, that you think is patent, you should file a provisional patent before you do anything, before you have a company. You're still at the invention stage. You're not at the product stage yet. You're not at the company stage yet. So it's not applicable. None of these mechanisms of funding are applicable at, at the invention stage. Invention first, product second, company third. All of these things that I'm talking about are company things. Not invention, not product, they're all companies. So the invention is value provisional, 
get a firm to do it, do it yourself, you know what you're doing, file a provisional application. At that point, you have a year to publicly disclose it. And if, some, and if you think it's getting traction and it's worth money and you can commercialize it, then you move into the product phase. Then you pay for the, to get that utility file, and then you, but the point is, I don't think you should ever be in a position as a company, as a startup company, as a young company, to not be able to tell people what you do. If you cannot tell people what you do, you're not a company. And I think that's a very important distinction to make. So I, I go to a lot of networking events, I, I teach a lot of classes, and there's a lot of people very hesitant to tell me what they do, right? It's, it's the secret that's gonna change the world and everybody's gonna steal it from them. And it might be true, most of, I mean, honestly, most of these ideas are not that great. But, but some of them might be revolutionary, world-changing ideas, right? Yep. And as soon as I hear it, I'm going to say, yeah, I'm going to do this thing. I'm going to steal your idea from you. I don't think the chances of that are very good, but that, that's the concern, right? That, a lot of people think this. So I think if that is the position you're in, file that provision and then tell the whole world and see if your convention actually makes some money. Uh, so to answer your question, you should not be in a position to do either equity or product if you still cannot tell people about your idea. And as a general rule, just tell people about your idea because the, the commercial value of your idea is much more valuable than the idea itself. Inventions are cheap. Everybody has invented many things in their life, millions of things. None of them make any money. And, and, and inventions are literally a new way to cross the street, a new way to use a word. I mean, it's invention can be anything, right? The invention that becomes a product that becomes a company is the value. And you don't really know that until you get to the company. And in terms of video, you said earlier, create a good video. You would recommend a professional videographer. And um, would, would you also put it on YouTube? The question is, would you, when you make a video, would I recommend a professional videographer? And would you post it online like YouTube? Yes, I would go as professional as you possibly can. But more importantly than that, I would give a lot of thought about what you want to communicate. And again, you're not a Tide commercial, and I don't want to keep picking up Tide, not a Coca-Cola commercial. You're, um, you're introducing a new thing. And it's a much grander, more, much more personal effort than a commercial. So yes, a videographer is great, but they're technical. They know how to shoot at the right angles and the right lighting and how to you know, edit That's the stuff. story. But yeah, the story is you. The message is you. So yeah, I would go as professional as you possibly can. Consumers like polish, and you have to present very polished image of who you are for people to give you money. Just like with investors. Just don't do Mickey Mouse stuff. I mean, yes, there's vloggers online, you know, that do that. Don't, do, you're not that. Go as professional as you can. Consumers love polish. So yes, I would recommend going very professional, but the important thing, that's one aspect of it, but the important thing is what is the message? What are you trying to say? And that's something that has to come from you. I know Facebook uh, video, Facebook Live is super useful. Uh, I know I'm trying to about it. Facebook video, Facebook Live specifically is so useful um, for to getting new customers. And we've built a lot of new crowdfunders through Facebook Live. Instagram video also, great, great way to crowdfund. Thank you. Yeah, as far as Facebook, absolutely. Facebook. The Russians use Facebook really well. <laughs> Facebook has a lot of wonderful tools. No, all joking aside, Facebook is great. Facebook is probably, I would estimate, at least 80% of all crowdfunding investments come through Facebook as long as they're not. So you have to know Facebook. Yes, sorry. Uh, any specific genre that we should follow in the video? I read somewhere that comedy gets higher conversions. The question is, is there any specific genre to use when you're shooting your video? Uh, comedy gets higher conversion. Yes, comedy gets higher conversion, but it's really hard to do. Um, unless you're really experienced at you know, screenwriting, copy, videography, the chances of you not looking awkward and weird while you're trying to find it are very small. Um, comedy, if you talk to any comedian, they'll tell you, like professional comedian, They'll tell you that has done drama. They'll always tell you that comedy is so much harder than drama. Um, so I think as an introductory, like we've never tried comedy. Uh, but yes, it's something that's very tempting. And when it works, it works. It's a genuine connection. You elicit a genuine response from a person when they laugh or when they giggle or whatever. Um, and that's valuable. That connection is valuable and monetizable. That being said, 
it's just so hard. We've never tried it. I know plenty of people who have and failed miserably. <laughs> I watch their videos and I'm like, no. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> cringe, just like, don't, just don't, just be serious. Uh, so yes, if you can pull it off, absolutely. But before you publish that anyway, run it by a group. See, and get their honest, but not your family members, your friends, but like, just random people. Like, people that hate me, yeah. Well, random people. People will tell you the truth. You think this is, funny, this is weird and awkward. If it's weird, not for you. Yeah, I, I guess if you, uh, if you sit them in front of your video and they don't laugh, you you have your yeah. answer. Right? Yeah, you can actually do blind focus groups as well, which you can actually do with a lot of organizations. Just sit a bunch of people uh, in a room. Uh, you don't need to know. They can be part of a different event and just show them a video. They don't need to know you're there or whatever. There, there's a lot of mechanisms yeah. to do that to run these things by people. But if you can pull off funny, more power to you. Uh, if you can't, don't. Uh, question in regards to the product. Now, assuming that we do a round. Uh, let, me, let me walk over. Yep. Because I'm afraid that people on the live tour are going to be interested. Yeah. Uh, so, as, just in regards to the product itself, uh, you do a current funding round for the product. Do you have a year to deliver the product, or, or? Or is there a cap in terms of the amount of money you can raise, let's say, you know, a million dollar round uh, to deliver the product within a year? It's a great question. Did everybody hear that question? It, it, when you do product crowdfunding, is there a period of time within which you must deliver the product? Um, is it six months? Is it a year? Is it, what is it? So when we did our Kickstarter, we promised to deliver a product in, I think, three months. Uh, we delivered it, we started delivering it in six months. So we were three months late, which in the Kickstarter world is two years early. <laughs> there is there's no set rule. Uh, yes, you should have a reasonable time frame that, that you can more or less meet. Um, that being said, as long as you keep an honest connection with the people who bought your stuff, you're fine. Just keep in touch, don't disappear. Vulnerability is an asset, I think, a lot of the time. So if you're having problems in your manufacturing on the product, you know, Kickstarter world, if you're having whatever delays, communicate that. Being People thinking about you is a valuable thing, even if the things they're thinking about you are not particularly good. Mm -hmm. As a startup, there's no such thing as bad news. Sure. Yes. Uh, let, me, let me walk over here. Sorry. if there are any restrictions or guidelines regarding how many people can invest in your company. And a separate question is generally how long should your video be? Okay. Great question. So the question is, is there a max to how many people invest in your company? Um, and how long should your video be? On the product side, there's no restrictions. On the equity side, and again, this is more of a lawyer thing, but there are certain things that are triggered when your company has over 2,000 investors, certain requirements that are triggered by law, mm -hmm. and then there's more requirements triggered by law when you have over 5,000 investors. They're not limits. You can exceed those numbers. Public companies have a lot of investors. You can have a lot of investors, but there's just more of a regulatory burden. Um, th on the video question, how long should your video be? People have really short attention spans. Right? So unless your video is very captivating, and I would watch some Kickstarter campaigns or whatever, product crowdfunding, equity crowdfunding, they all have videos, they all do. Watch those videos, and you measure when you're checking out of it. Mm -hmm. If you can make it for the whole video and you're still interested, that's the right way. That has to be under three minutes. Now, communicating everything you need to communicate in under three minutes is pretty tough. That being said, there are videos. There's a video for a Kickstarter campaign called Phono Music, uh, which is like 17 minutes of rambling. But it's rambling by really famous artists. <coughs> and that's captivating. I watched that almost that whole video. That's 17 minutes of rambling. And it's literally, it's rambling, and you don't really have any idea what they're talking about. They're saying, oh, this sounds really great. And it's whoever, it's famous people. That kept me very captivated. And that kept people captivated, that raised a lot of money. Um, there's other videos that are three minutes and you check out. Um, so realistically, there's um, it's there's no set rule. There's successful campaigns with one-minute videos. 
their successful campaign was 17 million views. Yes. Where would you find like the requirements by law that you were just talking about? Is that something by whatever uh, place you choose to go through Kickstarter or whatever? Um, the question is, yeah, let me repeat the question. Um, where do you find these requirements, the legal requirements and the burden and stuff like that? There's a lot of really excellent resources online. Uh, this is a young industry, but it's an industry that's very exciting to a lot of people. So there's a lot of writing of all sorts, and it's a rabbit hole. Once you start Googling this, you'll never stop. Uh, there's always more tactics and tips and tricks. The point is, if you want to do it, if maybe this workshop or in general you decided to pursue this, you should start looking into it. Um, all the platforms will have resources. Um, they're not, I mean, getting to 2,000, 5,000 investors is a lot of investment. That's, that's kind of a problem that you can put off for a while. Uh, but there are, there, there are definitely regulatory burdens and requirements that you should be aware of when you do that. And, and that's uh, equity, not product? Yes, with, perfect, yeah. With product crowdfunding, it's unregulated right now. So you can pre-sell. There have been, there, there have been lawsuits around um, falsely advertising the capabilities of your thing, not delivering in time, allegations of fraud. They, fortunately, there have been Kickstarters, Indiegogos, and product crowdfunding campaigns that have stolen money effectively. Um, right now, there's no regulatory, um, there's no statutory um, remedy to this, right? There's nothing prescribed in the law to deal with this kind of stuff right now. But there's private lawsuits happening. That might change. Um, with more and more people getting concerned about this, that might be one of those things that will change. The rule of thumb that I've heard is as soon as grandma loses her house, a law gets made. Right? So <laughs> it's just it's a matter of time. Uh, with the equity crowdfunding rule of thumb. Yes? Is there an average uh, ask on uh, uh, an equity uh, or a range on an equity crowdfunding per share? $20, $50? The question is, is there an average range of cost for how much you sell your shares for? Right. Um, some platforms will have a rule. Uh, some platforms will make you sell them for 100 bucks. Uh, I'm sorry, you have to buy $100 worth of shares, rather. How many ever, however many shares that is to okay. your company. Okay. Uh, some pl platforms don't have limits, and again, I think it's, it's we sell ours, our last round is at $400. So you have to invest a minimum of $400. Okay. Uh, with us, but there's companies that have sold minimum of $50. There's companies that have sold $100. So, again, it's really about knowing your customer and what your customer is going to afford. Yes? And there could be multiple offerings, right? So, like, if they invest up to 500 it's straight up, but if they invest twice that, then they get a discount towards the end? Or with a caveat. So, the question is, can there be multiple offers? You cannot sell two securities at the same time. What you can do is you can give some security away, right? And I, this is this could be interpreted as a gray area, but this has been proven over and over. And right now, there's guidance saying it's okay to do. So you can give bonuses. You invest five thousand dollars, I will give you ten percent bonus securities. So it's still the same security, just giving it away. But you cannot have two securities at the same time. Yes. You have different types of equity, like like you can in the regular world. Certain types of equity are, are worth more, yes. and that sort of thing. You can, you definitely can, uh, if you think it's advantageous to you. You can have preferred shares versus common. You can give certain rights to your crowdfunding investors. You can take away certain rights. Uh, we generally sell common. Uh, well, we haven't yet. We, we sell debt. Uh, and that debt doesn't even have voting rights. It absolutely it converts. So we actually have our investors proxy the voting rights to company management. And largely, it's a tactical decision because it's a lot of investors and it's hard getting everybody to vote just because just the sheer numbers of it. But another aspect is we want to keep the control in the company, and that's the security type that we craft. So it, it doesn't matter. It's your security. You can do whatever you want to. You can give them the best preferred in the world. You can make every one of them a board member. Uh, I wouldn't advise you to do that. But, you can. <laughs> <laughs> but um, from the other side, from the other point of view, when you're trying to invest in a crowdfund. Is there a possible? There is always a possibility your uh, your equity is going to go down, right? Every time they try to value the shares. Yeah, you get the loot. Yeah, a lot of times, right? 
every yeah every time you sell on one hand you get diluted on the other hand the thing that you keep the percent that you keep is worth more so although you might have less percentage of the company the percentage you do have should be worth more than it was before you got diluted so dilution is really a double edged sword on one hand i would i would much prefer to own 1% of google than 100% of nothing right yes but what if you don't have the right to ask even though your shares are worth much lesser than you you know both have been at the same time because you don't have the right to ask right i'm sorry can you repeat your question so you're diluting but you're not your shares are worth lesser than what they were you're diluting and your shares are worth less yeah. than what they were yeah, it's it's not really so you still have the way dilution works is that you still have the same amount of shares you had before Right, so let's say you have 100 shares, and you take an investment, and you give them 100 shares. You're not taking that 100 shares away from you. You're making another 100 shares for them. So the amount of shares you have, the physical, the number of shares you have, stays the same. The value of those shares, how much they're worth, should go up. There's something called, in valuation world, there's something called a pre-money and a post-money valuation. Imagine a pre-money valuation. How, how many people have heard that term? Okay, no, it's a good amount of people. But Basically, think about this. And if you watch Shark Tank, by the way, they don't get, there's no distinction and it's really horrible. Uh, and it does a really big disservice to people. A pre-money valuation is, let's say you have a car, right? And it's worth, let's say, 10 grand, right? And you want somebody to invest in your car because you're gonna do car things. And they put another three grand in the backseat of that car, right? So before that investment, your car was worth 10 grand. As soon as that investment came in, it's worth 13 grand, because they just put three grand in the backseat of that car that's already worth 10 grand, right? So every share, that's the post-money valuation, every share that you have is worth more, and you have the same amount of shares, but that represents a lower percent of the company. So dilution means you have less percent, it doesn't mean you have less money or less worth. So it's a double-edged sword. Yes, more questions? I think we're running out of time. Thank you, everybody, for coming out. Thank you.